little bloke didn't make it. He's a, he's a big lamb, but his mother obviously didn't have the milk or, or left him. And, uh, yep. and that's, what, that's what happens, you know, in a drought. Farmers across Australia are bearing the brunt of a brutal drought and a changing economic landscape. It's too dry. We need the moisture and there will be a lot of struggling farmers around this year. If you talk to the majority of farmers, most people are really second guessing whether they will still be in the industry in the next three to five years. The small towns that once supported them are struggling too. The problem is jobs, work. For me, nothing to do here. Why should I stay? In the Riverina district of New South Wales, Wagga Wagga has become a sponge for those leaving small towns hoping for better opportunities. Good education, culture, choirs, theatre, art, conservatory of music, it's all here. Yes, Wagga Wagga is a lovely place to live, and if I had my choice, I wouldn't live anywhere else. But here, as it is elsewhere, it is a tale of two cities. I think the devil would have you know, hesitations of visiting. It's pretty bad. A guy just up this way, uh, he got stabbed. See so cars getting burnt, houses getting burnt, people getting attacked. Nothing unusual for around here, everyone's struggling. The five kilometres south of Wagga's CBD are the suburbs of Ashmont and Tolland. Proud Wagga resident and local business owner Wayne knows the streets where people are doing it toughest. Hey guys! See, beautiful people. Um, there's a couple of burnt out houses. This is Marshall Street. Uh, they burnt this house out a little while ago. People have moved out. The Housing Commission haven't done anything about them. And they've just been trashed and then burnt. We've had a heap of houses burn over the last couple of weeks. Um, there's been some stabbings, they've been drug related. I mean, this is a country town. This is a country people. Uh, what the hell? Last year in Wagga, nearly a thousand incidents of malicious damage to property were reported. We're gonna get rocks thrown at us, that's all right. Um, it's, there we go, there we go, there's a rock. Worried his hometown was falling apart, uh, another dent. Let's see what's smashed there. Wayne kickstarted a local neighbourhood watch group. Today he's dropping in on Christy. Knock, knock. She's just become the latest victim of crime in the area. Been at work all night, come home, and it was about two o'clock in the morning, and then probably about ten minutes later, we've heard the car alarm go off, and then my daughter's come screaming from next door. Your car's on fire. Can't open the boot. It's devastating. Over 140 cars were stolen and set alight in Wagga in 2018. Just a few weeks into the new year, the number now stands at 150. They're on drugs. Same thing everyone around here, they're on drugs. Bought it, they couldn't steal it, so we'll demolish it. Someone's got something good we want, we can't have. We'll destroy it so they don't have it either. So, it makes me want to cry. Christy is a cleaner, working days and nights. Her partner has two jobs just so they can afford to pay their rent. But it means they're rarely at home. So keeping an eye on the place are 10 CCTV cameras. Oh, right, here we go. And then the sensor will go off, and then you can actually see them throwing something over the fence. And then five seconds later, you'll see it getting lit up behind, and a petrol bomb thrown over. And all my cleaning gear's in there. Oh shit! That's just bloody heartbreaking. That's that's a couple of grand out of your pocket. They're battlers. They're doing it hard, and I feel sorry for them. It's very devastating. Beautiful through the day until like come nine, ten o'clock at night. As soon as that sun goes down, 
It's like the vampires come out. And that's when it all happens, at night time. Five kilometres north of Tollan is Wilkes Park, where 72-year-old Bob has been squatting in his makeshift home. Fearing council rangers were going to kick him out, Bob has retreated further into scrub and onto Crown land, which falls under a different jurisdiction to council land. No one can kick me off of Crown land. You can stay here until the, till the day you die, and they can't do nothing about you. Whether he's right or not, tonight, like every night, he's doing his best to protect his home. Look, I've been here nine months, and there's been so many druggies come through here, and some of them have been bad, and I mean real bad bastards. I have been threatened and maybe had a bit of shit thrown at me, but I take it like water on the duck's back to me. Over the past decade, the number of homeless older people has increased nationally by 49%. It is now ten past two, and uh, I've been up since I've been up since one o'clock, and um, I call this the graveyard shift. Recent eye surgery to remove cataracts has forced Bob off the road, after 41 years on his push bike drifting from town to town. And when you've spent as long as Bob has living rough, you learn a few tricks of the trade to keep yourself safe. I have been dependent upon my own security. Now that means going to bed early and then getting up, say, one o'clock in the morning and staying awake until about five o'clock. That way then you are up and you are ready to go. If somebody comes and attacks me, I've got my shoes on, I've got my trousers on, I've got my long top on. So if it's cold out there, I can make a go for it. Well, you've got to be careful of the locals. The druggies, this, no. I mean, Wagga thrives on drugs, and especially staying so close to town, because all the druggies come down to these places. This is one of the worst parts of travelling around on a push bike on your own. Well, you get tired of it because I've got to sit up at night and, and, and look after my own security. Oh, shit. <laughs> I'm off to bed now. Five k's away, in the suburb of Tolland, South Wagga, public housing residents Catherine and Mason are moving on from their recent house break-in. The biggest thing that made it me decide, like, I cannot move is this is Susanna's home. As well as it being home for her daughter, Catherine's house operates like a drop-in centre for a tight-knit group of friends in need. What's Carly doing out here? Fuck off! Oh. <laughs> I'm busy cleaning up. Spending time there today is 19-year-old Kalia. I'm going to have a ball. And friend Ethan, who is partially blind. Have you ever seen Kalia cleaning before, Ethan? I haven't seen nothing for fucking two years, you madman. Found <laughs> Found a chip, sir. Ethan, are you eating that? They're my chips. You thought he was oh, eating Oh, I thought he was eating the fucking food. Because of his poor eyesight, Finding work is difficult for Ethan. How about lasagna? He spends most days at Catherine's. You get salads. Yeah, and the salad. Do you want a salad? Chips. Yeah, that's my best friend. Because I love him. But just as a friend, if that was my husband, I would have killed him a long time ago. <laughs> What's that, Coke? That's yours. What is it? Coke. Are you sure? Yeah. It's solo. No, it's not. It's it is. Coke. It is solo. It's it Ethan, I swear to you, buddy, right now, that is not solo. It is. I, I swear to you, what? that's not solo. I was telling that's you, is this one it was solo? Yeah, but that's not. It probably is. 
<laughs> you got to drink it now, you've opened it. With Susie Anna at Mason's mum's place for the day, everyone's in the mood to cut loose. You know, people running around the house laughing and mucking around. Come here, cat. <laughs> Ethan lost his sight two years ago when he fell prey to a disorder linked to obesity, something he battled in his teens and early 20s. At his peak, he weighed 220 kilograms. Now, considering I've only had no sight for two years, I'm doing better than I expected, anyways. Smoking weed is his way to escape. Fuck, you could have pulled the stem out of this cunt. Having your sight for 24 years and then losing it three weeks before your 24th. It's a big, big thing. <coughs> Even with the chaos, the idea of providing a safe haven is a dream come true for Catherine. I remember watching an episode of Home and Away and they had this halfway house, drop-in centre. I'd never heard of one of them in my life. And I was like, that's what I want. <laughs> Helping those in need must be in the blood. Catherine comes from a long line of women with big hearts. Mum had sort of opened up the house to a few young boys that were actually on weekend release from a juvenile centre. And um, my grandmother was a foster carer. I just always, it just always has sort of been there, that thought. Soon, she'll need to make room for one more. 19 year old Kalia is five months pregnant. It was um, a bit of a surprise. I cried. I sat on the chair and cried. Kalia and the baby's father are not together. I had, when, when I was in Sydney, I had no support. Like, absolutely none. And then the only reason I really come back to Wagga was because I knew I'd have Catherine's support 110%. Mm-hmm. This baby's coming, whether I like it or not. That's very scary. <laughs> In the southwest Riverina, 250 clicks from Wagga is drought-stricken deniloquent, where local farmers like Barry and Rosie haven't seen decent rainfall for four years. And when your family's been dairying for over 100 years like Barry's, quitting the land would be like losing a limb. Could never live in town. Never, yeah, it's just, yeah, I'd have to have a little bit of land around me. With only a few weeks of feed and water left, Barry and wife Rosie are staring down the barrel of having to sell their cows. Which is tough to stomach when you've been slogging it out as long as Barry. Now, I've worked roughly 80 hours a week for over 30 years, and if you added those hours up, I would have worked more than the majority of people in their lifetime. Dairy farming probably is pretty stressful you know, any time, but certainly when you've got drought, it's definitely more stressful. But this is basically um, man-made drought in many respects because of the management of the rivers. The Murray River Water Allocation Plan is a complex tapestry of waterways, gates and dams. Yeah, once a week we get this fax from Murray Irrigation and, it, you know, one of the things is they've got the number of gates open out to sea at, at the mouth. And you know, then today, this week, there's five gates open. The water's just flowing out into the ocean and we've got zero allocation. Who is permitted to use the water and when is highly controversial. So we're absolutely struggling, but the government seems to think it's all right to just let the water go out in a drought. But without access to surface water, Barry has been forced to turn to an expensive alternative. So this is our deep bore, which has been our absolute saviour this year. 
uh, with a zero allocation from you know, yeah, Murray Irrigation from, with our channel water that we've been able to buy in bore water off other farmers and um, yeah, we've been able to sort of keep the bed, the cows reasonably fed up until this point. Forced to lay off their employees to keep running costs low, Rosie, along with Barry, milks the herd twice a day. No! <laughs> no! Okay. At age 49, Rosie's also feeling the strain of having two little kids to look after. You're a little bit more relaxed, but you shouldn't have them this old. <laughs> You're a bit more exhausted, and knowing what the teenage years are and what you've got to go through, I'm not really looking forward to that. Hanging over their heads also is Lincoln's long-term medical diagnosis. Since his accident on the farm a year ago when his body was wedged between metal bars in the dairy. A specialist appointment in Melbourne is scheduled for a few months' time. the dairy stories. No, there's one story in there on someone that's got out five years ago, I think. Apart from the kids, Barry and Rosie have bigger concerns. Today in town, the major Riverina milk processing company will be announcing how much they'll pay per litre next year. If they announce a good price, it, it means hopefully you can make some money. And if it's not a great price, you just know it's going to be another struggle. Yeah, I would say we really need 55 cents a litre to be able to make some money. Currently, Barry earns 40 cents a litre. That extra 15 cents could get him out of the red and into the black. It's going to be an interesting day just to see what the state of the, the future dairy industry will be. If they don't, four generations of dairy farming might come to an end. Massive stakes. Yes. All right, you want to hold me hand? Today, Barry and Rosie are in town for the announcement of next year's milk price. It has the potential to pull them out of their financial hole. They desperately need 15 cents more for every litre of milk they produce. But the news isn't good. It's probably only about an eight, eight cents a litre. Um, yeah, improvement. Um, it's, it's certainly not as much as we would have liked. If it doesn't rain, the struggle will just be enormous to keep going. It's a massive blow, but they're not alone. In parts of southern Australia hit by drought, one quarter of dairy farmers are thinking about quitting. For now, they're not only leaving shortchanged, they've still got 350 cows that need milking. Then 
workload has been probably the hardest. You, feel, you can feel um, quite broken at times and quite like that you've given everything but it's not quite enough, you need to give a bit more and, and it has really taken some toll and you just, you're just amazed at your strength that you can actually do it sometimes. It would have been easier if I was 10 or 15 years younger. Lincoln would like me to play more with him and yeah, I'm too buggered most of the time. On any given day across the country, one in every 200 Australians is homeless. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, you just missed me in the nude having a bath. I'm sorry about that. Of those sleeping rough, one in ten are like Bob, over the age of 55. I'm not part of society at the moment, but I'm living on the edges of society. <laughs> Only three weeks after eye surgery, Bob's got another medical issue to deal with. Friday, I'll go, I'm going in for my prostate operation. I've got a swollen prostate and uh, I'm having trouble peeing. And I, don't, I want to investigate to find out exactly what is wrong. But before doctors will do the exploratory procedure, they need to know he'll be cared for on release. When you come out of anaesthetic, you always have to have somebody with you for, for, for at least 24 hours. If I don't find a place to stay on before Friday, they call the operation off, and then I've got to wait another three months, six months or whatever to have, to have the chance to have another operation. Like the thousands of Australians with no fixed address, Bob's fallen through the cracks in the system. A letter from New South Wales Health has only just found him, but it's 10 days too late. So they never sent me this letter advising me of my operation. Now I've only got two days to find a place to stay so I can have the operation, and I'm not very happy. So he's turning to the one place he knows where salvation can be found. Morning, Judy. Hi, Bob. How are you going? Very good. I ain't got a problem. You got some problems? Mm hmm So um, what's happening? Some idiot never sent me the letter. Yeah. That means I've only got two days to find somewhere to stay. Yeah. And because I don't know anybody in Wagga, yeah. I need your help. Yeah. I did go down to Baptist Care yeah. yesterday yeah. after I went to Wagga Base Hospital. I can't. And they said that you can't just walk down there and, and put your name down yeah. and book in. OK. And I thought about what a load of bullshit. Yeah, well, look, I'll, I'll give them a ring and see what needs to be happening and hopefully we can speed things along a little bit. OK, thanks, Judy. OK, Bob. Thank see you ya. very much. Make a few phone calls and ring around. We'll see what we can do and try and move the process along. Hopefully they'll come on board with us. Bob and the Salvos have a long history. He was left in their care when his mum abandoned him at age seven. Yeah, just put it in, put it in there, thanks. So when he can, he does his bit by volunteering. We sort out everything, like electrical, books, uh, crockery, uh, and that's what we do all day. It can be hectic at times, and sometimes you can get a good break, but most of the times it's pretty hectic. Hey, John. How you going? How'd you go yesterday? It really peed me off, mate. <coughs> Bob's a good bloke. You know, a bit of a Aussie knockabout, or whatever you want to say. Always seems to be happy. When you're down, he'll bring you up. My satisfaction is that I am helping somebody doing something constructive for somebody else. And that's the bottom line. For Judy, helping Bob find a safe place to sleep extends further than one night. She'd like to see him move into permanent housing. Tea's ready, Judy, ready, ladies and gentlemen. When Bob's ready, we'll... Um... 
We'll look at some accommodation that meets his needs. He's just got the stars above his head and, and for so long now that's been his life. For him to transition into a home, um, I think he's going to find it very difficult. Bob needs to be comfortable where he's going to be. I did suggest he could put the tent up in the lounge room if he wasn't. <laughs> Across town in Tolland, South Wagga, Catherine's house is providing a calm and supportive space for pregnant teenager Kalia and her best friend, 17-year-old Jenna, who's one month shy of becoming a mum. I've got four weeks and one day to go for Jenna. It's scary. It's scary. It's hard to think about sometimes. I cry sometimes when I think about it. And I'm going to be pushing and pushing. Teenage mothers do it tough. Nearly 30% have an income of less than $150 a week. And just under 50% have no income whatsoever. Which is why Catherine not only opens up her heart, but also her home. These girls are still young, you know, if they turn around and say, oh, I want to go to school or something like that, like, I want to give them that opportunity to still have them options. Or, you know, if they are struggling, I want them to be able to say, it's hard, like, like I see the good in them and that, and I want to help them, you know, another female there to encourage them. I love Catherine. She's cool. Because she's like our other mum. <laughs> Someone loves me. <laughs> she's cool. I oh, know, Susanna's about to be three. So I was 24 when I felt pregnant. Hi, Mummy. And like, Boy, still today, no. I have days where I'm like, I just don't want to be a mum today. So I just want these girls to know that they don't have to be the perfect parents or they don't have to, you know, feel alone. As long as we're doing good by ourselves and the baby, then Catherine, Catherine will stand by us 110%. But if we show Catherine that we don't want her help and that we just want to go out and be gronks, then Catherine won't help us. Okay. Three. Okay. Four. Four. Five. Five. High five. <laughs> it's the end of the month in Daniloquin which means the farm's accounts need to be settled. So you've got rates, water, workers' compensation, grain bills, repairs, land tax, etc, etc, etc. And um, have to be paid today. Juggling bills and balancing the books is Rosie's job. All right, I'll add them all up again, see if we get the same number. It takes me a whole month. It takes me four hours to do paperwork. So it takes me four days to get this ready to be sent out. It's a bit sad, isn't it? Oh, I should have done it. It's too late. So what have I done wrong? <sighs> Seven, nine. The job's made tougher when you live in the bush. We don't have any internet service here. And, uh, Yes, you feel like you're a little bit backwards, but that's life. Nearly one in four Australians living in remote areas don't have access to the internet at home. That's coming. Do you know what a fax is? They can have a look at it come out the telephone. Because <laughs> I don't have an email. Between the number crunching, Rosie's thoughts keep returning to next year's milk price. With an increase of only eight cents per litre, it's half of what they need to start making any money. We know they're only offering what they, they can, as much as they can. So now you know the price, you know what you're gonna get next season. Now you can make a, a decision clearly on if you stay or not. That decision is something they can't afford to stall on any longer. But for Barry, there's more to it than just money. He'll, he'll tell you 
the cow's, he'll tell you the cow's mother, he'll tell you the cow's grandmother, and he, he just talks about them with such a passion. To me, they're just a cow that I milk. To him, it's, um, it's his life, I guess. And you're asking somebody to give up their life. Two hundred and fifty kilometres away in North Wagga, and it's the morning of Bob's prostate procedure. I'm at that age in my life where I start to suffer all these old age complaints, and uh, uh, and it makes no difference whether you're healthy or not. Some problems you can't avoid. At 72, Bob's not alone with prostate issues. One in six men develop prostate cancer before they turn 85. You start to wonder, am I really as healthy as I think I am when I'm going in for an operation? But what sets Bob apart is how he lives. As I get older, I'm going to lose my fitness and one day something's going to bring me down. His procedure today is only possible because of Judy, Bob's caseworker from the Salvos. Good morning, everyone. She's managed to find him a free bed for the night to recover in. Hey, Judy. Hey, Bob. So how are you feeling, Bob? You a bit nervous? Yes, of course I am. You are? Because a healthy person like me going to hospital, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense, does it? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yep. Okay. Off Take we go. In. <laughs> A few hours later, the procedure is done. Uh, I'm still a bit woozy from the anaesthetic at the moment. Now at Towner House, I'm staying here for the night. Well, come on in. Thank you Your bed is all ready for you. I think Bob tends to just keep plodding along and ignoring little warning signs of, of health issues. Pop your things in your room. Do you want me to take them for you? Thank you. Your room is this way. He did say, like, I think I should be in a house. It's time to stop travelling around. Maybe a glass of water. Yep, how do you have your coffee? Just flat. Yep, not a problem. Hopefully it won't be some sort of medical issue that forces him in because his choice is taken away then. Tonight at least, Bob has a roof over his head and will be sleeping in a proper bed. Something he hasn't done much of in the past four decades. Nearby in the suburb of Tolland, sleep could soon be a thing of the past. <laughs> Mason and Catherine are at the hospital right now with Jenna. 17-year-old Jenna has gone into labour, with Catherine at her side. And how do you feel? Did you want to go to the hospital as well? No, fuck that. OK. I, I've got to give birth to my son in four months. I'm not watching her go through that. Then, then I'll have very... I'll be shitting myself even more. <laughs> Never been so scared of something in my fucking life. <laughs> It's not only the birth Carly is frightened of. After a troubled childhood of her own, it's protecting her growing child that worries her. And my, my mum growing up, she's done a lot for us kids. But I've got a different mindset than my mum. My mum wanted to put us kids in bubble wrap and never let us leave the house so she could protect us from the big bad world where my son's gonna know. There's monsters out there, and you just got to stay away from them. Up until she fell pregnant, Kalia was using the drug ice. It was an 
everyday thing. It was just a part of my life. Like, that was my life. It's just fucking shit. What is? Methamphetamine. Yeah, the only thing it really does for you is take the people you love away. Actually, you do that by allowing a drug to control your life. But anyways. First time I ever touched ice was, um, something pretty bad happened. And I come to Wagga, and yeah. Have you ever talked to anyone about it? Nah, I talked to a counsellor ages ago, but fuck that shit. There's just some choices you have to make in life, and it was either drugs or a baby, and I chose my baby. The lifeblood of a farm is water. No water means no produce. In drought-ravaged Daniloquin, Barry and Rosie's survival relies on a bore they had installed on their property. But now, those prospects have suffered yet another blow. Um, yes, our bore um, stopped working over the weekend. We've got basically no water left because you just can't get it out of the ground. So the, the pump was pumping that. Yeah, it's no wonder it stopped working. There was a, a collapse above the, where the pump was and um, the hole's buggered. Before the bore broke down, Barry estimated they had enough water to last 55 days. So in a year like this where it's not raining at all, it really probably couldn't happen at a worse time. So we've got no water to water the paddock, so we're at it, we'll be out to feed in two weeks. So from 55 days now, we've only got 14. <laughs> it's a bit of a disaster. That's life. Yeah, without the bore, it's equivalent to, I suppose, being pushed over an edge of the cliff where you just have to make a, another decision. Yeah, I think my wife would love me to make the decision that, yeah, that, that that's it. The sad thing is I can't make that decision. Yeah, it's me that's got the ties to milking. So that's what I'm still still struggling with the idea, you know, that thought of not, not, not milking cows. The bore water not only irrigated the property, the farmhouse relied on it as well for washing and cleaning. So it's just not very good at all. Yeah, Barry, I was just wanting to get a quote for drilling a new bore. The average waiting time is over six months. Yeah, okay, it's Barry. I was just wanting to get a quote for um, replacing a bore. My freezer's full. I think I've got six months of food in there. Should make it. <laughs> Yeah, we'll just have to sell some cows and <laughs> to make the bank payment. Yeah. All right, thanks for that info. All right, bye then. I need a job, I guess. All right, so this, there, all this stuff. Yeah, don't marry a dairy farmer. The stress. And for us, it's the end.
it's the start of a new day and a new life in the suburb of Tolland. Guess who's home? 17 year old Jenna is now a mum. And although she's living with her mum, she's come to Catherine's to show off her new son. <laughs> no, this is my baby John. <laughs> That's good being a mum. I like it. Just look at his face and I get to do the rest of my life with him. When he's unsettled, I struggle with it. And it drags me down. But then I look at my son and I've got to do it for him. Next, it'll be Kalia's turn. And with seven weeks to go before her baby's due, she's getting ready. I think I'm gonna spew. Only recently off the drug ice, Kalia craves a better future for herself and her unborn son. I was an eight-year-old girl that was forced to grow up. I had no choice in the matter. From an early age, Kalia was bounced between family members. Without a stable home, she fell in with the wrong crowd. I was just already a feral of a kid. I don't know, I thought it was cool going in and breaking into houses and stealing cars and high speed chases. Oh, I used to love them. Imagine working your whole life to get something and then just to have some little 15 year old grunk come and take it from you in a matter of seconds. For the last four or five years, I've had to battle with a drug addiction. Becoming pregnant may well have saved her. This baby has come into Kalia's life at the perfect time. Like, did I think she was ready to be a mum or not? Did I, I did I like know how she would cope? Not. But over the last few months, just watching her with Susie and I. I just know, like, she's a mum now, like, like, I just know it. If I didn't grow up, my son would have no one. I hope he chooses the right, the right lifestyle. My son's more important than any crack pipe any day of the week. Today, Bob's being released from Wagga Base Hospital. Five days ago, he rushed himself to emergency on his push bike when complications arose after his prostate examination. Apparently, they thought it was an emergency because I was peeing a lot of blood. So they rushed around, fussed over me, did everything they could to try and help me. Doctors were able to stop the bleeding. But as the days progressed, Bob was unable to urinate on his own. So the decision was made to insert a catheter. I said, I got no option, have I? They said, you got no option, Bob. It's just, it's got to go, whether you want it, want it not. So I just said, OK, put it in. The catheter will need to stay in for at least two weeks. The bag's full. I've got to empty it. If I don't, it's going to build up inside my bladder and I'm going to be in terrible pain again like I was for five days. I can cock my leg like a dog, open the valve up like this. Bingo. It just runs. And you wouldn't even know. Decades of sleeping rough are finally catching up with Bob. But when it's all you've ever known, it can be hard to see a way out. I've never heard of anybody or seen anybody walk out of a hospital and two hours later jump on a push bike and ride away 
with a catheter stuck up his prick. <laughs> this is going to be very, very interesting. <laughs> it is dirt. <laughs> I am not about to let a catheter stop me from riding my push bike now. Oh, that does hurt a little bit. Unfortunately for Bob, the pain is too much. He simply can't face the three kilometre ride back to his tent. Yes, I don't know. I didn't want to walk out. This fella here's a problem. It's been my best friend. It's got me everywhere from point A to point B. It's done, it's, it's done over 100,000 Ks. And now I'm sitting on the corner of a fucking street, just walked out of hospital and wondering whether or not I'll ever be able to ride again while I got this thing stuck in there. So I'm just sort of sitting here wondering. For the first time in 41 years, moving into permanent housing feels inevitable for Bob. I think, seriously, I think I have to start looking for a flat as soon as possible. Because uh, I don't know what problems I'm going to have with have down the track. I can't camp out when I'm in this state. To me, it's a bit like taking a bird, a, a bird out of the wild and putting it in the cage. How would you, how would, how would somebody feel if they were put in a cage like a bird? When the chips are down, having someone to lean on can give you the strength to get back up. He kissed my belly. For some of us, that's family. This is more of a home than it is a house. That's what I reckon. A house is just a house with no love oh. and a home is a house with love. But there are the families you're born into. I like these moments. And then there are the families you make yourself. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like that 60-year-old grandmother that has all their grandchildren home. I'm 27, but honestly, some days I feel like that. We, I love the smell of babies. Yeah, now he's born. She's like, I just want my son. <laughs> I love these guys. Even when I don't like them, I still love them. Does that make sense? Next time on Struggle Street, it's D-Day for Barry and Rosie. We'll load it up and say goodbye to them. Yeah. And then the roar of the engine, the swirl of the dust, our cows have just gone into the four winds and disappeared. No running water, toilet or electricity. This is where I get my water from. It's the least of your worries when you've spent years battling the bottle. I just come up here and drink. Jim Van and Coke. Having a sick child is devastating for a parent. He may end up in hospital every three months. When their illness needs constant medical care and help is over an hour away, every day is a struggle. Boy, 